Hey gang, it's me, Dr. Steve. Let me ask you a question. What comes to mind when you hear the three letters D-E-I? Well, if you're slightly dyslexic, you might think demise, but <laughs> you actually wouldn't be too far off. If you wanted to know what's really behind the crazy woke marketing disasters of Bud Light or Target or Disney, you actually need look no further than DEI corporate initiatives. But there's another demise associated with DEI or DIE, I guess. My guest today believes that the recent decision by the Supreme Court officially ending affirmative action, particularly with regard to college admissions, actually spells the inevitable doom for such initiatives. I have the honor of being joined once again by one of my academic heroes, the award-winning Professor Carol Swain, formerly of Princeton and Vanderbilt, as we were talking beforehand. Now she's an academic gone rogue, exchanging the classroom for a camera. Her work has been cited multiple times in Supreme Court decisions. She's an author of numerous books. And her latest is The Adversity of Diversity, How Real Unity Training, Real Unity Training, Can Promote Healing in a Post-Affirmative Action World. I've actually got my autographed copy here. Thank you, Dr. Swain, for that. And welcome back. It's an honor to have you here once again with us. Well, thank you. And thank you for being such a leader and warrior. And like we were saying before we started, we're doing a lot of damage in the real world because we traded our classroom with maybe 30, 100 students for the whole world. It's so true. And again, you and you were talking about this earlier. You have a Prager U video. So again, Ken, you just had just I don't know yeah. where you were before this. I had a friend of mine back in 2016 tell me, hey, you should start a YouTube uh, channel. And I thought, oh, I have a PhD. We don't do YouTube. You know, I've had just, right. I just was so rude. I was waiting for my pipe and my tobacco and all that. And then, and then I started doing it and I found I could actually reach numbers I never even dreamed of. You, however, have a PragerU video that hit, what, 30 million, you said, in views? The, the, the video... Um, I have about six PragerU videos, but the inconvenient history of the Democratic Party, which was the first one, uh, has reached over 30 million. And it went viral a second time. And the second time had to do with reaction videos. And altogether, my PragerU videos have reached uh, well over 70, mid 70,000. They say it could be 100,000 because they can't capture or a million, right? So, yeah. Reaction yeah. videos. That's so, right. That's yeah. right. I'm reaching uh, the world. <laughs> in a way we never could in a classroom, right? Yeah. Exchange the lectern for a <laughs> microphone and it's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely amazing just how the world's being redefined. And that fits in with online coursework and so forth. But, just... but wait a minute. The people that wanted to marginal marginalize people like me and you or other academics they thought when we left academia, that would be the end of us. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because it really did open up all sorts of possibilities for communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're, I'm hearing the same thing from Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein, a number of other academics who have joined the Network Society, as it were, and are finding that their work has uh, has reached uh, more lives than they could have ever imagined on a college campus that's so proximate based and the like. You know, before we dive into your book, I was curious on uh, just this amazing trend that's happened since the infamous mugshot. Um, and I've just got to ask your opinion on this. The extraordinary surge in black support for Donald Trump uh, that we're getting in the polls. I'm thinking particularly of Rich Barris, uh, the People's Pundit, his polling shows that, and this is since the mugshot, Trump has doubled his support among black voters. He's at 19%, uh, he, I think he got 12% or so in, in 2020. The latest Fox News poll corroborates that almost to the number. They're, they're giving him 20% support among black voters. What in your opinions, what was it about that mugshot that just seemed to to resonate there? Well, I think black people identify with, I want to say that 
that they identify with mugshots, but they know that the criminal justice system is far from perfect. Right. And I've had people contact me and tell me that the Republican Party ought to be reaching out to liberal black organizations because they have complained about the corruption in the criminal justice system. So they see Donald Trump's indictments and uh, the mugshot and all of this focus on getting a person using the criminal justice system as unfair and as something that they have experienced and they sympathize with Donald Trump and they believe that it's all concocted, but those kinds of things happen to black people, they would say, and no one was paying attention. And now they see it happen to Donald Trump and they do sympathize with him. So fa- I, I heard it put in, in effect that one, that, that one moment transported Trump from one cultural space to another cultural space. You know, so, so I've heard it put that if you ask you know, your average non-white working class voter, how many Manhattan billionaires do you know <laughs> versus how many people, unfortunately, have had mugshots taken do you know? So in the one act, in that one act, Trump went from one cultural space that was so far totally removed from their life experience to one that's fully embedded in in a life experience that's more familiar to them. And, and, And it's translating, at least in part, into political support. You know, I thought about this, too, because I saw that Alan Dershowitz wrote the forward to your book. I mean, it just really seems like we are in the midst of a political realignment. Uh, I I mean, right. I mean, Dershowitz would refer to himself as uh, he's a self-described liberal. Um, Same with Elon Musk. He would say he was center left. Bill Maher. Jordan Peterson to a certain extent. Now they're all being labeled. You know, hey, hey so I have I, more evidence of change. I was invited this year to participate in a panel at the American Political Science Association. I hadn't been back there for years. I was invited. My expenses were paid. The registration fee waived. I will be uh, debating on the uh, campus of Washington and Lee next mm-hmm. month. I'm part of a a uh, panel of conservatives, uh, University of um, uh, of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, that that is taking place, and it's like academia has taken notice of conservative ideas and thought. Wow. They are willing to give us another look, and I believe that we're going to see some shifting and transformation on college and university campuses because they're far more receptive. Wow, I would hope so. Oh, that'd be wonderful to see. Yeah, I, so I've, I've heard the Gen Z generation referred to as the Jordan Peterson generation and that they really starting to get very concerned about clamping down on free speech and the like. I know there's a whole wing there, a, a substantial wing that's all for that, but nevertheless. Uh, well, it's, also yeah. colleges and universities, uh, people are not going to college at the same rate. Parents are not seeing it as a good investment. Right. And I think that... It, to the extent that universities become more open to conservative conservative ideas, it's because it will be part of their own survival. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. They have everything to gain for it. Absolutely. The last time we uh, chatted, I looked back in my notes. Uh, you had just uh, published a very successful book, Black Eye for America, which uh, focuses on the evils of critical race theory. So you're, so you're, you're taking on some three-headed dragons here. You're going from CRT now to DEI. And, uh, but the bridge uh, between the two seems to be um, affirmative action. And then you've got this wonderful chapter in here. I think it's chapter two. Carol's educational journey in an affirmative action world. So it's again, what I love about it is you're not this disinterested scholar. I mean, you're this is there's a, there's an autobiological uh, uh, bio- autobiographical element uh, to this uh, for you. What, give us some background on why you felt it was so important to write this book in particular a- after your CRT book. And this is coming right. I mean, this is within. We're still in the shadow of the Supreme Court decision, which just came back. Where it came grows. out in June. Right. And it grows out of my experiences. And you might note that I have had two co-authors, 
they both happen to be uh, white males of different generations who have been impacted by critical race theory and uh, affirmative action and in the worst sort of ways. And so that for me, I care about fairness and equality and for critical race theory, I got involved because there were so many reports of young white children coming home in tears because of something a teacher said about their ancestors or about them being guilty. And I saw the shaming and bullying of small children. And that broke my heart because I care about all children and this is America and no one should be shamed or bullied. And so critical race theory became my passion. And with diversity, equity and inclusion, it was so clear. It's like a layer imposed on top of race-based affirmative action that is far more aggressive. It doesn't even give lip service to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And the cases of discrimination against whites and Asians had become so egregious, I felt that I had to get involved. And once the Supreme Court uh, took those cases, I was certain that they would have to strike down affirmative action because that was the only way to put the brakes on DEI and CRT. And so 90% of the book was written before the Supreme Court uh, decision. In fact, in late June, we waited wow. uh, because the book couldn't be completed. And there was always the possibility that they wouldn't have the courage to strike right. down affirmative action, which would have meant the book would have had to have been rewritten and we would have focused on the missed opportunity <laughs> of the Supreme yeah, Court yeah. not uh, acting. And I argue that DEI uh, and CRT violate the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause and our civil rights laws in the same way as race-based affirmative action. And I stress that uh, things have gotten so bad in the workplace uh, the people that are pushing the programs have forgotten that the civil rights laws protect all persons. Mm -hmm. And that includes white people, Asians, it includes men uh, as well as females, heterosexuals as well as homosexuals, Christians as well as Muslims and Buddhists. Uh, those groups uh, have not been enjoying the same equal protection of the laws as racial and ethnic minorities. And in the chapter that you referenced about my own experiences, when people argue, and they always argue, you benefited from affirmative action and now you're trying to pull up the ladder. You don't want anyone else to be successful. What I believe I benefited from the most was the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that ended discrimination on the basis of race. Uh, it led to equal opportunity and to active recruitment of talented minorities who got their feet in the door. But once they got there, they had to meet the same standards. They had to prove themselves. And in my own case, I started at a community college, you know, and I met the dean's list there and I transferred to a four year college. Uh, I graduated magna cum laude uh, working full time. I went in um, with the goal of being an honest student. And so I did what it took. I read books on how to write essay exams, how to take objective tests, how to study. I applied the principles and guess what? They worked. Right, right. It's so funny because I think this is, this is why it's still hard for some people because, I mean, what you're talking about in terms of the more nefarious tendencies of denying constitutional rights to some, certain people, it hides behind buzzwords that have an air of, you know, civic virtue to them, right? Inclusion and, and diversity. And I guess equity is perhaps a bit more unfamiliar, but it sounds like equality. So it's got to be good, right? These are the terms that are supposed to give us the warm fuzzies. But your argument is that the, the meaning of these terms have gone through a very noticeable change over the years. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, and I would argue, and I'm sure you too, that there's nothing wrong with diversity itself, the original concept. And it used to be the job of a diversity officer to go uh, you know, maybe to a historically black or Hispanic or, or maybe to Appalachia and look for people that were underrepresented. 
Right. And so they would make them aware of opportunities. They would encourage them to apply for jobs. That was what diversity was about. And then if they applied, you tried to integrate them into whatever setting. Well, somehow along the way, diversity changed its meaning. It became all about groups and all about the group members retaining their identity as group members. And we have seen that even though the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited race-based segregation, that on our colleges and universities, very quickly, they resegregated. You ended up with black dorms, yeah. uh, black uh, graduations, and now black course sections. And within the public schools, there have been some public schools that have been outed for for segregating classrooms and putting right. black children with black teachers. And um, total violation of the Civil Rights Act. It's not something that black parents want. They want the best teachers to teach right. their children. Right. And it's a shame that they've gotten away with this so long. And the left is the most racist group because they really do believe that racial and ethnic minorities can't meet the same standards, even though there were minorities who were successful before the um, uh, Affirmative Action uh, Act. And mm -hmm. I tell people in the book that affirmative action was never a law passed by both houses of Congress signed by a president. It was a series of executive orders and the civil rights movement never demanded or sought preferential treatment or quotas that came from white male elites that came from progressives who believe minorities are inferior and they have gone over the edge now because they argue that math is racist and that minorities have to have lowered standards uh, minorities are victims forever minorities can't don't they don't even give them the credit and ability to be racist themselves they argue that only white people can be racist right. and they punish asians for being successful right that's right yeah we had Ken, I, our mutual friend kenny Shu on uh uh what last year sometime um who's who's now obviously uh uh, running around doing his gloating tour, he finally got. <laughs> didn't think he was going to get a, a affirmative action decision that quickly, but uh, but he's he's just made a fantastic argument against Asian discrimination in uh, the universities. Is it is it fair to make the distinction? I'll bring back a little bit of your your uh, new white nationalism thesis. Is it fair to make a distinction here between how we shifted away from civic nationalism to say like an ethno? Uh, nationalist tendencies and the, and that the vocabulary changed in relation to that shift. I'm, I'm thinking, of course, among our elite institutions. So whereas prior affirmative action and diversity programs were more for the purpose of promoting civic nationalism, uniting us all as a, as a polyethnic people integrated around common civic traditions, particularly the tradition of equality of opportunity, whereas now the DEI is more about fostering a uh, select form of kind of, of ethno-nationalism, uh, obviously going beyond just ethnicity, uh, you know, orchestrating predetermined racial, uh, gender, sexual outcomes that actually calcify and fortify tribal difference. Is, I mean, is it, is, it is horrible uh, what we have done uh, in America. And when I wrote the new white nationalism in America, that was a uh, warning pretty much that we had taken identity politics and multiculturalism too far and that we needed to pull back and move towards the American national identity. And what has happened is that, and, and in that book, I didn't talk about Marxism or any of those uh, concepts that now I'm so steeped in, but you see the Marxist influence and the divisions and just they, they want groups at, at each other's throats. They want to use race uh, as a wedge, and I remember the point. I remember after President Obama was elected, and some of the things he did. And I said to myself, if I wanted to uh, generate a race war in America, I would do exactly what the left is doing. Wow. And you also may recall that those flash mobs where young uh, black people would go into stores and and take whatever they wanted from the shelves. That started during the Obama administration and also the knockout games where a young blacks would knock out an elderly white person or an Asian or some unsuspecting person yeah. walking down the street. 
And all of these things uh, were not a part of Black culture until after the Obama administration and the focus on restorative justice and uh, and just this whole sense that we've taught, you know, a generation of young people that they are entitled, that they are victims, and that they are pressed, and uh, and they uh, and that they're entitled to take it out using violence. It's something that's tragic. It is tragic, and it and it's uh, yeah, and it it fits in with the whole notion of not knowing what a woman is. Just this ins- absurdity and insanity. Uh, an irony uh, of it, because again, going back to, to your uh, original book, this is now 20 years ago, right? The New White Nationals. I'm not sure. I'm sure it wasn't right, your first book, right. but uh, a very important. It was uh, the first book that I wrote after I became a converted Christian. And ah. I thought it was going to be my last academic book because I thought I was leaving academia, but it took me probably another 18 years or, or at least uh I didn't leave right away 15, 16 years later. I left academia, but uh, I thought, I've always thought it was my most important book. Uh, And it was written as a warning. And, you know, fast forward to the day and you just see the the collapse of America. And if we don't change course, we are going to have a situation where people will not trust anyone of a different race or ethnicity because they don't know when that person is going to try to harm them. I'm, just, I'm looking back here to see if I've got my copy in my, I've got two two libraries, so one down here, one upstairs. I think it's upstairs. I don't see it over there. I, I should hold them back uh, next to each other because here at Gang, you could see Dr. Swain's extraordinary thought process over these last 20 years. What you argued in that New White Nationalism book that was so good you pointed out that the new white nationalists were happening not because of some like you know renaissance of darwinian biological supremacy god you know bury that forever but because more and more whites felt as if they were new objects of discrimination right precisely because other racial and ethnic groups could celebrate their racial and ethnic distinctiveness whereas whites were told you can't do that. You have to be a radical, sovereign individual. You're a racist if you celebrate being white. So now here's this book where we have a bunch of DEI, uh, what do you call them, instructors or officers or what have you, ironically telling us that that white nationalism is the worst thing on the planet and they're the solution to it. And what are they doing? <laughs> they're, they're doing exactly what you diagnosed 20 years ago. They're making whites feel more and more like objects of discrimination, victims of a double standard for, for ethnic celebration, which gives birth in your terms to the new white nationalism that DEI officers claim not only to be opposed to and as the worst evil in the world, but that they're the solution to. But you know something, they have uh, white nationalism uh, or, or white supremacy was declining in America when the new white nationalism was published. There probably were not 2,000 Klansmen in the whole country. And of the 2,000, 1,000 were probably FBI agents. Uh, the neo-Nazis were almost totally, had almost totally disappeared. And so what the political left did is that they were beginning to target whites. You had uh, the guy from Harvard uh, talking about race traders and cl- uh, encouraging white people, people to become race traders. You had the beginning of whiteness studies and whiteness studies was not like black studies celebrating, you know, your blackness. It was about white people um, being told how guilty they were for all the problems uh, in the world. And it was always aimed at shame and deconstruction of the white race. And so when I wrote the new white nationalism, there were uh, things that were taking place at the colleges and universities that, uh, you know, that just it took a while but then we ended with this blatant discrimination where they openly call out white people and white people are victims you know it's not they used to complain about reverse discrimination and reverse discrimination was real going back to the Baki case in the early 1970s but I can remember when everyone laughed at white people when they uh, mentioned reverse discrimination 
but it has reached the point that it has to be addressed and you see successful lawsuits like the woman who sued Starbucks and ended up with a $25 million settlement. And there have been uh, cases of men who have sued about discrimination. They're winning their cases. And I believe the judicial system uh, for the most part is recognizing that there, that white people do have rights, that there is a constitution's equal protection clause. There are civil rights laws and that we cannot follow this path. And when you think about it, whites are a minority in many parts of the country and in the whole nation by 2047, they will be a minority in the whole nation. There is no way that we can continue the path that we've been on without, uh, you know, uh, uh, having some type of, I don't know, um, maybe not a war like the war between the states, but increased violence among and across groups. And I believe that we can have unity, that we can go back to e pluribus unum, out of many one. And in my book, I talk about the birth of an idea that became a company after George Floyd's death Uh, when I saw so many corporations pouring billions of dollars into um, diversity programs and uh, sensitivity training and Black Lives Matter, and we know what happened to that money. And I knew that they could never bring about racial reconciliation or healing because they're built on a conflict model. And so um, I felt that it's important to know our civil rights laws. There's nothing wrong with knowing the civil rights laws there's a lot of good things about diverse environments, but we can have diversity without discrimination. We can have a diversity by just a, a, adhering to our civil rights laws that um, prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, sex, color, national origin, and religion, disability, and maybe they've thrown some other things in, but just non-discrimination, treating people as individuals and respecting their rights under the the, uh, Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And then, you know, let's just go back to the golden rule, treat other people the way you want to be treated. If you applied the golden rule, you would have uh, more harmonious workplaces and uh, university environments. And I think the solution is simple. We just need to stop discriminating. We need to stop violating the Civil Rights uh, Act uh, in the constitution. Wow. Wow. That's uh, what a summary. Is that, is that what your, your hope is for people to, to take away from, from reading the adversity of diversity that, that what is that lasting impact you're hoping for? Cause obviously this is unity. a very important It's work. all about unity. And I unity. believe we can have unity and that ending race-based affirmative action, wherever it appears, ending these diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, the e, uh, ESG um, um, mm. uh, assessments, what do you yeah. call those things that they put on indexes, indexes yeah. that they um, evaluate corporations. E- e- of- Elon, Elon Musk says the S stands for satanic. <laughs> well, but, I mean, all of these are pressures. And the thing about DEI programs is that they don't work. Right. And what happens is they bring in a person that probably majored in uh, a field that ended in studies. Uh, <laughs> one of those people, we wondered how they would ever get a job. They come in and they uh, there's no accreditation. They do the divers- diversity training. And they single out white people. They may tell them to shut up, listen, you're guilty. Don't even bother to tell me that you love all people and you're not racist. And then they tell the black people, and they may have been happy with their jobs, and uh, they tell them that you're a victim. You should be further along. When the training ends, you have a disruptive, disruptive, uh, disruptive workplace. Some of the white employees may leave if they were forced to attend the training and the racial and ethnic minorities who previously were happy will be disgruntled because they think they should be further along. And then if organizations set up the affinity groups, those are gripe sessions. Yeah. So you divide your workplace into various groups who meet 
and they uh, meet to pretty much grumble about the workplace, uh, that is not uh, constructive at all. And I don't believe it's constructive for organizations to try to use the human resources office to send out emails every day telling people, you know, to celebrate someone's special day or to do something to protect a particular group. Uh, the focus of the unity training is to get companies back on mission. Every organization was um, was formed to create for a certain purpose. So there's purpose, there's mission, there's goals behind organizations and what DEI and CRT and all of this push, uh, what, what these initiatives have done is to push organizations away from their mission. And, um, and so you think about corporations, the purpose of a corporation should be to maximize profits. That used to be what they were about, not social engineering. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Gang, you got to get this book. You know, I have uh, a number of academic heroes I cite all the time. And I know those of you who are regulars to this channel, you know that Carol Swain stands tall among them. Get this book, The Adversity of Diversity, How Real Unity Training Can Promote Healing in a Post-Affirmative Action World. Professor Carol Swain, thank you so much for being with us again. Thank you so much. Are you ready to join the resistance? Because I'm leading a group of dedicated, courageous patriots who can lead a spearhead into the heart of the secular globalist establishment. We punish Bud Light and Target, driven CNN and the legacy media to near bankruptcy, forced BlackRock to backtrack on ESG, and now we're seeing our conservative-dominated Supreme Court ending affirmative action and protecting religious liberty. In my Insiders Club, I show you concrete steps to take locally and online that will only keep this mass uprising going until the battle is won. Don't wait. Click the link in my description below and join my Courageous Patriots Insiders Club today.